After taking the LHBA class, I came back and excitedly told my wife, we need to buy a piece of land. These guys are the real deal. So we bought this little 3.7 acre tract with 20 plus year old southern yellow pine trees growing on it. And we started cutting trees. The neighboring six acres was also owned by the same guy we bought our land from. And he wanted us to cut as many trees as we could from his land as they were too crooked for logging companies. The trees averaged 17 inches in diameter. Many had butts that were over 24 inches. The tips were around 12 inches. At 44 feet long, a large log like this can weigh over 6,000 pounds. I had a hard time moving them. I bought this tractor, but it couldn't lift them high enough to get up on the trailer. I kept breaking things, so the neighbor taught me to weld. I used my new skill to make a log arch, which made it possible to lift the logs high enough to slip a trailer under them. Then I used the trailer to haul the logs over to the build site. Once on the build site, they have to be stored on racks and peeled. They were hard to peel when fresh, but if you wait a little while, bugs come out and just eat the bark, and they are much easier to peel. They are then treated with a borate mixture to prevent bugs and mold. The borate mixture is made from antifreeze, borax, and boric acid. The mixture is then sprayed on the logs. The LHPA class teaches you to make a model before you start building. So at night, when we weren't cutting trees, we were busy making this model out of brown paper bags and dreaming about our cabin with a wraparound porch. Once we had enough trees and we knew how big they were, we started laying out the foundation. Meanwhile, I found a deal on some plywood for the concrete forms, so I got started making them. I also made some collars to put over the piers to keep them from blowing out when the concrete is poured, because it's heavy stuff. This home has a pier foundation with 31 concrete piers. There are two types of piers, small and large. The small piers hold up the walls and interior floor joists. There are three large piers that hold up the roof, and they measure 6 by 6 on the base. The other piers are 3 foot square on the base. There isn't a lot of concrete in this home compared to a normal home. I buried the piers as high as I could before poor day, and we only had one blowout, and it wasn't even that bad. Stacking logs is the most exciting part of the build. We were poor, so we asked some guys from church to come help us install these lifting poles. I prepped for getting them installed by digging a trench down to a four-foot hole so the poles could basically just slip into the holes with a little help from the lifting crew. Then we lifted our logs with block and tackle. If you're rich, you buy a telehandler to do this part. Getting the first layer down is the hard part, since you have to set the logs down onto the rebar instead of pounding it into the log like you do for all the other layers. Holes are drilled into the logs every two feet and offset by one foot every row. Rebar is pounded into the log and halfway into the log below with a sledgehammer or with a jackhammer with a special rod driving tip attachment. We had to fight mud, weather, heat, and crooked logs. Slowly but surely, our home began to rise from the mud. Once the walls were tall enough, the final logs to lift were the cap logs. These logs provide some overhang for the roof. I needed something long and large, so I used two logs with the fat ends sticking out and spliced them in the middle. We also installed two of the three RPSLs with block and tackle. They support the 70,000 pound roof and are held in place by a rebar embedded in a pier and then bolted to the wall logs. A third RPSL was later installed in the middle by a crane. I scrounged around the neighborhood for enough trees to make the rafters. They are 5 by 12s and are 29 feet long. I saved $7,000 by making them on my sawmill and not buying them. For the ridge pole, I found a nice big sweet gum tree at the back of the property and cut it down. It's 65 feet long and is 34 inches at the base and 17 inches at the tip. It was so heavy, I couldn't move it at all. I let it lay there until one day I saw a guy down the road mowing with a bigger tractor than me. I waved him down and offered him 40 bucks to drag it up near the house. I wanted to lift it mechanically, but winter was coming on and I didn't have a month to get things ready. By my calculations, I would need about $600 for lifting equipment, 
My wife suggested I call a crane company just to see how much they charge. I can't stress enough how dangerous it would be to manually lift a log of this size, 30 feet in the air. I found a company that would do it for about 700 bucks. The guy confirmed the monster weighed 10,000 pounds on his scale. I pinned it in place, but it wanted to roll a little, which freaked the crane guy out. He pulled off the job, and I had to winch it in place while we figured out how to stabilize it. Luckily, we found a new crane guy that wasn't scared, and we set the middle RPSL and all the rafters in place in one day. All the neighbors came out to watch, and everyone cheered when the crane guy honked his horn after the last rafter was set in place. The girder log holds up the second floor. I picked out a log, and we installed it sideways through the house with block and tackle. The girder support log, or GSL, supports the girder log in the middle of the house. The rafters had to be leveled at the ridge pole and on the cap logs. They are then spiked with rebar to keep them in place. The roof is a built-up roof, which means it's built in layers, beginning at the decking. The decking is 2 by 6 by 16 foot tongue and groove, also called car decking. There are over 800 of these boards on the roof. They are more than just pretty. They are part of the structure of the house. Every board was lifted onto the roof with block and tackle. I left the rafter tails intact at the peak until I had the decking installed close to them. This makes it safer to cut the tails off. Once the decking is in place, a waterproof membrane is added. At some point, I got smart and built a roof elevator to get the rest of the materials up there. Ribbing is installed over the top of the membrane to hold the insulation in place. I used EPS foam some guy on Craigslist was selling for $4 a half block or $8 a full block. He was re-roofing a senior center in Chattanooga, so I rented a U-Haul and stuffed it to the gills with foam insulation. I got all this for 400 bucks. Once the insulation is in place, I added plywood decking over the top, then tar paper, and then shingles. With the roof finished, we turned our attention to the subfloor. The subfloor is held in place by a rim joist attached to the first layer of logs all the way around the house. There are six interior piers that hold up two major support beams across the middle thirds of the home. All the 2x12 floor joists attach to either two rim joists or a rim joist and a major support beam. Three quarter inch subfloor panels are nailed to the joist. There are about 50 sheets of these subfloor panels. For a few years while building, there was never a place to set anything down that wasn't dirt. It was very exciting to get a solid, dry floor in place. Now that we knew how high the floor was going to be, we focused on the doors and windows. Since the logs are so large, I used the sawmill to create these 4x16s for the doors and windows. To cut out a door hole, you screw 2x4s to the logs as a guide for the chainsaw and simply cut out the spot for the door, making sure to avoid any rebar. I had to lower the cut logs down with block and tackle, as even a 4-foot section of one of these logs can weigh a few hundred pounds. You don't want that thing dropping on you. The frames are screwed together with half inch by eight inch lag screws and then the 500 pound frame was installed, yes, with block and tackle. The frame is bolted to the log walls with half inch by 12 inch lag screws. There's no need for any kind of spacing to account for settling in an LHBA home. I made the doors with lumber from the hardware store and a table saw for about 160 bucks. My wife finished this one with black paint. The doors weigh close to 200 pounds. The window frames are made just like the door frames. We got these windows from the thrift store for about 60 bucks for four of them. I put two of them together for the living room window. The upstairs windows are slightly smaller at 4 by 12 inches. For a long time, the only way in or out of the home was by crawling under the house. It was nice to finally have a door we could lock with all our tools inside. I had run out of large trees for the second floor, so I turned to my buddy Daniel Webster in Georgia for some 20-foot 4x12 cans. I met him online when I was having trouble with my sawmill. Him and his brother Cody are awesome guys. They delivered 33 cans for a great price, and I gave him a tour of the home. 
for the floor brackets. I didn't want the ugly galvanized ones they sell at the store for 20 bucks a piece. So I came up with a plan to make my own for about $4 each. I found some 8 inch by 8 inch steel from the guys at Service Steel and had them cut it into lengths I could fit in my truck. My buddy Ellery has a brake to bend the metal at his shop. We folded everything but a flap on the back, which I then later welded into place. I put up a ledger board in the kitchen and attached the brackets, and then I used block and tackle to get the 300 pound 4x12s into place. One end rests on the bracket, and the other end lays on the girder log. It was really cool to finally start seeing the place getting closed in. With all the windows and second floor in place, it was time to seal up the place. The LHBA method is to install mineral wool in the gaps between the logs, and then nails or lath for the weird or big gaps, and then cover it with natural mortar chink. I mixed the chink in a small cement mixer using sand, lime, and cement. The chink is then applied over the nails and insulation. The nails are what keep the chink from falling out, since it won't stick to wood. This part of the process is probably the most mind-numbing and boring part of the whole build, but it still has to be done. I also closed in the gables. This is just non-structural 2x6 framing, 3 8 inch plywood sheathing, a vapor barrier, and board and batten siding. The only difficult part is the height, as it is between 20 and 30 feet high. The most exciting part of the build is definitely stacking logs. Everything else after that is just normal construction. Framing is part of the normal construction with one key difference. In an LHBA home, you can put the walls wherever you want, since they are not structural. We started off with this kitchen wall, since the bathroom, laundry, and bedrooms were all dependent on the placement of this wall. Bathtubs come in pretty standard sizes, so it was important to get the dimensions correct. My wife spray painted on the subfloor where she wanted the walls, and I just did all the installation. We decided to run all the electrical through the interior walls instead of in the crawl space, just to minimize holes in the floor. I also partially framed in the upstairs bathroom since we needed the framing to support the drain lines for the future plumbing. Even though we were building on grid, I still wanted a backup heat source in case the power went out, as it often does during our intense storms here in the south. I found this cast iron wood stove on Craigslist at a bar in Nashville. They were remodeling and offered me the stove for a hundred bucks. It's the same model my dad had in his garage when I was a kid. I took it apart and cleaned it up, gave it a new coat of high temperature paint. Then we took it out to the cabin, dropped a plumb bob from the roof into the kitchen so we could get an exact location for the chimney. The entire kitchen is designed around the location of the chimney pipe for the stove. Once we knew the location of the stove, we laid out the hearth for it. Everything's built to meet or exceed fire code. You don't want the place burning down in a fire. We found a good deal on bricks from a sign that got destroyed by a tornado. My wife picked out the bricks she liked and mortared them into place, almost completely by herself. She said it was like laying out a quilt. I designed the chimney pipe using parts recommended by a nice lady on the phone at Selkirk. The bottom part of the chimney is just single wall pipe, but you have to switch over to insulated pipe once you penetrate a floor or a ceiling. The chimney cost us about 1600 bucks. It's really expensive stuff. But the fire is great on a cold day. Just like other parts of the home, making a model of the stairs helped us figure out how to do the real thing. My neighbor had some guys come in and cleared the trees from his driveway. I let them put the trees on my property and found out there was this really nice oak log in the pile. I took it over to my sawmill and cut it into 3 inch slabs. They are 16 inches wide and 17 feet long. I figured they weighed about 500 pounds each when wet. I installed them with block and tackle. They were so heavy I didn't feel comfortable with them just attached to the girder log, so I provided a 6x6 six six post to support the one that isn't bolted to the wall. I have another friend that had an oak tree die in his yard, so he let me have the trunk and I made slabs out of it for the stair treads. Then I cut the slabs into strips and glued the strips together for strength. My neighbor let me borrow his planer to finish them. I made uh, brackets out of angle steel. The stairs cost me about $150 to make. I'm not sure how much custom stairs like this would cost, 
but I bet it's over $10,000 with labor. There was a lot of planning to make sure the railing could fit along the stairs as well as meet up with the balcony at the top and continue all around the second floor. The posts are made out of 5x5 five five and 4x4 four four oak posts I made on my mill and 2x4s for the rails when I ran out of oak. My wife was smart and polyed the stairs before I installed the rails. The balusters are half inch rebar. I got really sick of cutting rebar as there's probably a half mile of it in my home. Installing the rails took some figuring to get it right and I used different methods for the stair rails compared to the balcony railing but it ended up all fitting together uh, really nicely and it's very strong. Electrical is fairly easy in an LHBA home. You can run the electrical through the gaps in the logs and through the framing almost everywhere else. The outside chinking had been done previously but I left the chinking on the inside unfinished um, because I knew I was going to use the gaps for my wiring. Where it made sense to go through the logs, I just used a spade bit to get the depth I wanted for the box and then drill down into the log until I hit a, a gap to run my wiring. Some people try really hard to hide all the wiring, but I used a lot of half-inch conduit and just painted it black. It works well in this style of home. I made sure to label everything. Most homes have the meter installed right on the outside wall, but I didn't want a big piece of plywood screwed to my logs collecting moisture, so I installed the meter at a pedestal instead. Plumbing is actually two parts, drain, waste, and vent, called DWV, and supply lines that feed all the fixtures. I started with the DWV system. It's all gravity fed, and it all has to slope correctly. I started with the highest drain on the first floor, a toilet at the back of the house. We decided to use a 4 inch main line even though 3 inch is fine. I found it to be very complicated. I had to draw everything out in 2D but install it in 3D. Some of the angles are really difficult to visualize. The drain system carries a liquid and solid waste while the vent system takes care of the gas which exits harmlessly out the top of the roof. There are all kinds of rules on what kind of pipe and fittings can go where. Here's an example of my parts list for the second floor bathroom. And here's the actual system. There was no other way to pl plumb this tub. I put in a water manifold like a circuit breaker but for water and then connected everything to it with PEX pipe. We put the water heater upstairs to save space for a shower downstairs. The main supply line is only exposed in this area under the house. I put a 4 inch pipe around it and filled it with spray foam to insulate it from freezing. This 200 foot long trench is how the sewer gets to the road. With the electrical and plumbing in place, we were ready for drywall. Some folks think a log cabin should have wood walls inside. For me, that's just too much wood, and it makes my eyes tired. Drywall breaks up the look of wood everywhere and really makes the logs pop. Installing it around the logs, however, can be tricky. My poor wife had to go back and fix all my mistakes. Our new favorite color is this Zen color in the kitchen. Finishing meant getting the surfaces to a point we could live with permanently so polying the logs became a priority. It also meant insulating the floors and chinking the finished areas of the first floor and over the stairs and moving my shop upstairs. We needed a kitchen counter. My wife and I made this gorgeous counter out of oak that I milled. I turned the slabs into three inch strips which we test fitted and then glued into a counter. After lots of gluing, sanding and fitting it we were finally satisfied with it and I cut out a hole for the sink. Here's the finished counter. I kept getting the runaround from the inspector on what we had to do to move in. I finally nailed him down on some requirements in May of 2023. He wanted exterior stairs, which meant I had to move the swing from its 30-foot perch. 
He also wanted finished floors in the wet areas like the kitchen, bath, and laundry, and all the electrical had to be covered with drywall or chinking. We had to have a working bathroom. Here's the finished bathroom, all tiled, mudded, and painted by my wife. It wasn't the inspector's requirement, but my wife wanted finished floors in the bedrooms before we moved in, so I installed the oak flooring in the bedrooms and hallway, and she stained them, and then I polyed them. The drywall with the calming colors, the logs, the hardwood and tile flooring all fit together nicely in this home. We were pretty happy with how the kitchen turned out as well, along with the shelves in the pantry and the open spaces around the wood stove. It all works together. Our hard work really paid off and it is a beautiful home.